I'd like to welcome those who are joining us online to the message today. Of course, welcome again to all of you here. Uh, we will be in the uh, chap the Gospel of Luke again, chapter 1. And so if you want to use your Bible, whether there's it's one underneath your, um, your chair seats or on one you have on your phone app, please do so. You can turn to Luke chapter 1. And before, as you're kind of getting uh, turned to that page, I'd like to give you a few suggestions for Christmas Eve that might help kind of liven things up for you a little bit. And these suggestions are all going to take a bit of preparation, so that's why I'm telling you now. So number one, what you can do is you can, you can go get an Easter Bunny costume, or maybe sew one. And then on Christmas Eve, dress up like the Easter Bunny. And then when, when uh, Santa comes, you can look at him and say, this neighborhood ain't big enough for the two of us. So there's one thing. Now, this next one, you're going to need to get eight reindeer replicas, and you want to hide them outside. And, uh, and what you're going to do is, uh, while Santa's in your house, you're going, to replace, you're going to take all of his reindeer and put them in your garage or something and replace them with the replicas, and then watch what happens when he tries to, to fly off with the replicas. So that's number two. And then this last one doesn't involve too much preparation, but you're going to need to get some official-looking documentation. And uh, again, when Santa comes to your house and he's inside the house, you're going to find his sleigh, and you're going to put a speeding ticket on his windshield. So those are some things you can do. Preparations are important. And today we're going to continue looking at the events that occurred in preparation for the birth of Jesus. And we're in particular looking at some of these events through the eyes of Luke, the historian. The first Sunday of Advent, as we uh, started looking at this, we looked at Zechariah and Elizabeth. And the angel Gabriel came to them and, and explained that they were going to have a child. And it would be miraculous because Elizabeth and Zechariah were too old to have children. But they needed to get prepared to have a child named John. Last Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent, we looked at Mary and how the same angel, the angel Gabriel, came to her, this young woman, and announced that she would have a very special baby, Jesus, to which she replied, may it be uh, excuse me, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And that's where we left off. And today we continue with, with verse 39 of Luke chapter 1. Before we do that, I'm going to share a prayer. We're going to have a few more uh, inter introductory, introductory comments, and then we'll start looking at the scripture. So please join me in a brief word of prayer. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be found acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many of you are parents, and I want you to think of something for a moment. Even if you're not a parent, you can probably envision this. You have a child, you're going to have a child, but you're not going to be able to keep this child. You're going to need to give the child to someone outside of your family. And the nice thing is, is that you're going to get to choose the person or the family where this child will be placed. It's not just going to be random. You're going to, you're going to get a, a voice in the matter. What kind of criteria would you use as you're thinking about where your child is going to be placed to grow up? What, what are you going to, where are you going to put this baby that will be in his or her best interest? Well, I think a list of criteria might include being raised someplace that ha has a lot of opportunity. That would be a good thing. Educationally, uh, job-wise, uh, other kids to play with. I mean, just opportunities that are, that are there for you and your child uh, or for your child. 
maybe being raised in a family that has moderate to high financial resources. Now, we know money's not everything, and in fact, some of the wealthiest people can be some of the most miserable people. So I'm not saying that that's the answer, but if we're looking at an ideal package, the whole, the whole picture, that might be on your list as well. And then thirdly, raised in a family with good parents, with good parents. God was in this position basically long ago. Jesus, his only begotten son, would be raised in a human family. And God, being God after all, got to choose, right, where his son would be born, who would raise Jesus. Did God choose a family who lived in a place with lots of opportunities? Not really. Nazareth, uh, well, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That would have been okay, but he was raised in Nazareth, and Nazareth was not really much of a town. And in fact, one of Jesus' disciples, before he met Jesus, but he was just finding out about Jesus, and he learned where Jesus was from, I shared this last week if you were here, said, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? This is kind of the reputation that Nazareth had. There was really not a whole lot going on. It wasn't a good place to live. So for some reason, that was not on, that might have been on your list or my list, but that wasn't on God's list. Did God choose a family with resources financially? Again, not really. Mary and Joseph were poor people. Mary would sing, we're going we're gonna to see this in just a bit as we go through Luke chapter 1, Mary would sing, thanking God for being mindful of her humble state. There's another translation, her low estate. She was not in the upper echelons of society. And later in chapter 2 we find of Luke, we find out that when Jesus, is, when he was born, his family took him to the temple to be dedicated. The Ideal sacrifice would have been a lamb and a bird, but if you couldn't afford a lamb, you could, you could offer two birds instead. And that's what Mary and Joseph had to do. They didn't have money to buy a lamb, to have a lamb sacrificed. So again, wealth apparently was not part of God's criteria. Might be part of, on our list, but it wasn't on God's list. Did God choose a family with good parents? Ah, check. Yes, indeed. Mary and Joseph. In fact, Jesus could not have asked for better parents. So today, we're going to look in particular, not so much at Joseph. That really would have to be for a, a whole other message, but we're going to look at Mary a little bit more. And that's what we're going to do. So, um, uh, let's talk about her. Verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now, Mary had just accepted God's word through the angel Gabriel that she would become pregnant. That, that this would happen not through natural means, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. We learned last week also that Mary was a virgin. She was probably, by the cultural norms of that time, young, 13 years old. That was typically when young women began to have babies. That's not part of our culture, obviously, but that would have been the norm at that time. Presumably, she let Joseph know about this. This was who she was betrothed to. And you can read about Joseph's reaction if you go to Matthew chapter 1. We're not going to talk about that today. But after she told Joseph, she hit the road. She, she needed to get out of town. Sometimes when something momentous happens that's earth-shaking, it's nice to be able to get away for a little bit. And that's what Mary did. She got away. Mary was told... 
by Gabriel also, when Gabriel said she was pregnant, that her relative Elizabeth also was pregnant and was going to have a fairly miraculous birth as well because, again, she was older. She was past childbearing years. And Elizabeth, uh, I think Mary probably felt like Elizabeth is somebody that could understand what Mary was going. If anybody's going to understand what's happening in Mary's life right now, I mean, this is a very unique situation, but perhaps Elizabeth will understand. So Mary goes there. She goes to Elizabeth's home and stays there for several months. Now, this was a brave journey. Elizabeth didn't live right next door or even in the same town. Mary had to travel 90 miles to get to Elizabeth. Now, for us, that's a drive up to Phoenix. But in those days, it took well over a week to take that journey. On foot, likely. And this was not necessarily a safe journey either. Jesus told this parable called the Good Samaritan. You can read it in Luke chapter 10. And in the story, it starts out where Jesus is talking about a man on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho who gets beat up and, and left for dead. Now that's a story. But Jesus used things that were common of that day when he told his stories. He wasn't telling stories that people would have wondered, what's he talking about? No one would get beat up on the road from Jer No, Jesus is explaining this, and people would have understood, oh, yeah, that could happen. So this was not necessarily a safe journey. And Mary is a 13-year-old teenager making this journey. So at the very least, we can say that Mary was faithful. She had already said, may it be, she had said to the Lord, I, I, yes, I, I will trust you. I will receive what you have given me. And we, all, and we know that she was brave. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, so Mary has now arrived at Elizabeth's, when, Mary, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth, was, this is Elizabeth's baby, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Now here we have a prophecy. Elizabeth is sharing this prophetic word spoken loudly. Prophetic words don't necessarily have to be spoken loudly. But in this case, they were. And Elizabeth, these words were clearly not her own. She would have had no way of knowing that Mary was pregnant. It's not like Joseph picked up the phone and said, hey, um, my fiance is on her way to your house and she's pregnant. We're not sure how this happened and uh, could you take care of her? It wasn't like that. And before Mary, Mary arrives, before she's even put her bags down or had a chance for Elizabeth to offer her a drink of water after her long journey, here is Elizabeth. She, it, it's like it's, uh, it's uncontrollably launching out of her, her whole self, this prophecy that's blessing Mary and, and, and the child she will bear. And it's brought about by this leaping of her own baby, John, in her womb, and he, he's doing something in there. And the Holy Spirit is working in Elizabeth, and she just starts pouring it out. She calls Mary, in verse 43, the mother of my Lord. The mother of my Lord. Now that word, Lord, is kyrios. Kyrios. It's a title for God. And in fact, Luke has already used this title for God ten times prior to getting to verse 40, 45. So, for example, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth, it says, Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands 
and decrees blamelessly. It's a reference to God. Now, Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord. She's basically telling Mary through this prophetic word, you're the mother of God. This baby, Elizabeth's prophecy confirms, is God. God in the flesh. And verse, uh, excuse me, that's verse 43. And then in verse 45, it says, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And here's another, here's another, this is part of the prophecy, and it's another indication, as we talked about last week, that Mary did believe when Gabriel came to her and said, you're going to have this child. And, and, and Mary said, well, how can this be? And we kind of wondered, did she was she questioning the angel? Was she skeptical of what the angel was saying? Apparently, she believed it. And we talked about the difference between her and Zechariah last week because Zechariah had an announcement also about this impossible thing that was going to happen. His, his older, he was old, his older wife was going to have a baby, and he did not believe. And he was rendered speechless. In fact, at this very moment in the Scripture, he is still speechless because he will not be able to speak again until... Elizabeth's baby, John, is born. His baby, John, is born. And so uh, Mary believed. It is so easy to doubt. It is so easy to be skeptical. In this world that is so difficult, there's so much wrong. Some of you have had a year that you would probably like to forget about. You're hoping 2020 is going to be a better year. But God has made promises that he will fulfill. That's the promise. Unfortunately for us, they don't always happen quickly. <laughs> you know, Mary got this word, you're going to get pregnant and... Mary was pregnant, and not very long, you know, nine months later. I don't know if there might have been a little gap in there, but it was very soon. The promise was fulfilled, but many promises are like the ones that were made to Abraham and Sarah. If you have a, a notion of, or an idea or remembrance of that Old Testament story of Abraham and Sarah, and they were both well along in years too, and they were told they would have a baby in their old age, and Sarah laughed when she heard that news. She was like, I don't know. And it didn't happen. It took over, we're not sure exactly how long, but it definitely took well over a decade before. And so Sarah's getting older and older, and she's thinking, yeah, see, I didn't think that was going to happen, but ultimately she became pregnant. And so sometimes these things take time. God's time is not our own time. But blessed are we when we believe that God will fulfill his promises to us. It may not be happening right at this moment in your estimation, in your analysis of your life, and you're thinking what's going on in your life. You may be wondering, well, what's God doing here? Where is God? What's happening? But the promise is there. God will fulfill God's promises. And it's now that Mary begins to sing what is known as the Magnificat. And, and these words, again, prophetically become, come pouring forth from Mary. And she starts to sing. I'm gonna, we're going to sort of break this down into two sections. So here's verse 46. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. The song just comes pouring forth from her. Now, there's a doctrine. We started to talk about this last week, and I said we'd flesh it out a little bit more this week. There's a doctrine 
called the Immaculate Conception. Some people think it's the same thing as the virgin birth, but it's not. The doctrine basically states that, that Mary was born without sin. And she lived a sinless life. Now, it's acknowledged that Mary was born of two parents. There was a male and a, a female, a man and a two married couple was involved. And they had Mary, but that she was preserved from the stain of original sin. This is a doctrine that is primarily believed by Catholics. And on, for example, one website of a Catholic church, actually one in Yuma, it's called the Immaculate Conception Catholic Parish. And here's what, it's, it, there's a, there's a, right on their front page, there's a prayer, and here's how it goes. Uh, o God, who by the immaculate conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary didst prepare a worthy dwelling place for thy Son, we beseech thee that, as by the foreseen death of this thy Son, thou didst preserve her from all stain, so too thou wouldst permit us, purified through her intercession, to come unto thee. Now, most Catholics would not go so far as to say that Mary was not in need of a Savior. But the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception starts to get dangerously close to that idea. Because if you're sinless, if you are born without sin, you live a sinless life, why do you need a Savior? There's no need. She can be almost godlike. But her song clearly indicates her need. Her spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's what she's singing. And this is very personal. It's not just my spirit rejoices in God. He, he saves you all. You know, the rabble out there. And he's God thus saved. No, it's very personal. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And, and she also sings of his mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. <laughs> That's God's mercy. And Mary needed it as much as any of us do. She had a fear of the Lord. And we're not supposed to fear the Lord like we're cowering in a corner, just scared out of our minds. But God is a fearful God. The power of God, if we were to, to really try to... Under, it, it's overwhelming. And... I don't know about you, and I've shared this. You know, I've been to the Niagara Falls. And the Niagara Falls is beautiful. And you could go up in this boat on the, on the river that's underneath kind of where the falls comes down. You can kind of get close to the falls. And you can just feel the spray just coming off. And it's incredible. But I will tell you that if that boat started to go closer to the waterfall and try to go under the waterfall, I would be scared out of my mind because that's a powerful waterfall. There needs to be a fear of the Lord. That's what we're talking about. And Mary was a human being after all. She was blessed but not sinless. She recognized, as we shall see, the power of God not some ability that she has to intercede or purify us. That's something only God does. That's something only Jesus does, not Mary herself. Now, after, this, these, after these, uh, couple chapters where Jesus is born and, and there's a few uh, stories about when he was a, a baby, we're going to be getting to those a little bit later, that Mary, Mary appears in a handful of other stories. She's not heavily involved in the Gospels after Luke chapter 1 and 2. But there are a few stories. For example, there's the story of when Jesus was 12 years old and they go to the temple and when they leave, Jesus winds up getting accidentally left behind and Mary and Joseph have to come back searching for him. So there's that one. There's the story of the wedding at Cana. This is early in the Gospel of John where Jesus winds up turning water into wine and Mary's there and she's part of the action there. 
And there's this other story where she and Jesus' brothers come for Jesus. They're, they're afraid for his sanity, they're, and they're afraid for his safety, and they, they kind of want to try to get him maybe home where he can rest. They're, they're concerned about him. And Jesus is talking with a bunch of people, and he's, it's reported to him, hey, your, your mom and your brothers are outside. And does he say, oh, my mom. Oh, my God, you got to meet my mom. She's just, whew, you, she's like, I worship my mom. No, he doesn't say that. In fact, what he says is, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he looked at those seated in a circle and said, here are my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, Jesus wasn't denigrating his mom. He wasn't disrespecting her. He wasn't putting her down, but he wasn't also not raising her up. He's saying, whoever does God's will, that's part of my family. That's God's family. Now, none of this is really meant to denigrate Mary. And in fact, we started with her faithfulness and her bravery, and we're going to end with some of that too. And why I think Mary is an incredible woman of faith and an inspiration for all of us. Uh, Nor am I trying to denigrate those who hold Mary in high esteem, but, but we need to look at the biblical record. And we need to make sure as we look at her through the eyes of of Luke and, and others who wrote uh, the stories about Mary in the Bible, that what we see in her is on solid ground. That we're not putting her up on a pedestal that she does not occupy or ever has. Now, she continues with her song. The next series of verses are both amazing, I think, and revealing. So let's Start with verse 51. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, I said that these are amazing verses. Why? They're amazing and revealing. So first of all, the amazing part. William Temple, who was the the Archbishop of Canterbury, instructed missionaries when they went to India, a very poor country, when they went to India to share the gospel, He instructed them never to read these words of this song in public because it could incite riots in the street. These are some powerful words about God's action in the world. God is not to be trifled with. It may seem now like things are not as they should be, and indeed they aren't. Things are not as they should be. But Jesus is Lord, He is Savior, and in His time and in His way, He will come again. He will set things right. The old order will pass away. A new order will come. A new heaven and a new earth will be established, and we will leap for joy. And you can read these words as a prophetic word about what that's going to look like. The rulers being brought down, lifting up the humble, the the hungry filled with good things, the rich sent away empty. And I said these are uh, amazing verses. I said they are revealing verses as well. Why is that? Well, these verses, along with the other ones already already discussed, contain many... um, Allusions to the Old Testament. They're, they're sort of full of Old Testament imagery. Which indicates to me that Mary was familiar with the Scriptures. That she knew them. So, for example, verse 53 says, He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. That sounds an awful lot like 
a couple places in the Old Testament. Psalm 107, verse 9. He satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 5. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. So it's not the exact quotes. It's not like she's piecing together, but she's using this imagery that she has learned from a child, from her parents. And this song is now flowing prophetically out of her. I said that Mary was chosen in part because she was a good parent, chosen to to bear the Messiah because she was a good parent. And she was a good parent in part because she was brave. But she was more than that, she was faithful. This young woman, 13 years old, plus or minus, believed in God. She believed God. She knew His Word, the Old Testament. She knew God's history, God's prophecies, God's promises. And she trusted them to be true and trusted that they were applicable in her life and the life, the lives of the people of Israel. What Paul later told Timothy, who was a young pastor, this would have been 60 years later. We're not even sure that Paul and Mary ever met. They, they may have. Paul's words were written down decades after Mary had all of this happen. But they could easily apply to Mary. Here's what Paul said to Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Mary was and is an example for us all. Even those of you who are young. Especially those of you who are young. And hopefully not just an example, but an inspiration. Can we learn from Mary to lean into God? no matter what is happening in your life right now, to trust Him, to believe His promises, to act on His Word, to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. When we do, when we do so, it is to our own joy, and it is to the glory of God. Amen? Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, thank you for the example of Mary, the inspiration. This brave young woman, this faithful young woman can teach us so much about you, about life, about trust, about bravery, about faith. And Lord, in this season, we, we need that. We need to know that you are there. We need to know that your promises are true and that we can trust you. And Lord, you've, you've given us this faith. Help, help, us to, help it to be strengthened. Help, help it to grow as we, as we walk in your footsteps and see more and more who you are, what you're all about, that you love us, that you have joy for us, and that you have our good in your mind. Lord, we lift it up to you, and if there's anyone here who has never received you as Savior and Lord, I pray that today would be that day, and that you would come into their hearts and help them follow you always. We lift it up to you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.